So my theme this afternoon, friends, is what does it mean to say that the human person is in the image and likeness of God? We had occasion several times this morning in the discussion to mention uh, the idea of being in the image and likeness, and I even uh, suggested that this helps us to understand what is distinctive about being human. By the way, that is, I didn't mean it to be distributed now, but okay, um, that's just the two texts I was working from this morning, from Greg of, Gregory of Natsiansus and from uh, St. Maximus the Confessor but you can read them at your leisure. Um, th it's not relevant for this afternoon's talk. Yes, in the image and likeness. Uh, there is a story told of Thomas Carlyle, great Victorian, that he returned one morning from a uh, morning service and said with irritation to his mother, I cannot think why they preach such long sermons. If I were a minister, I would go up into the pulpit and say no more than this. Good people, you know what you ought to do. Now go and do it. And his mother said, I, Thomas, and would you tell them how? <laughs> now, this brings me to something said by St. Epiphanius of Salamis in the 4th century. He says, it cannot be denied that all humans are in the image of God. But we do not inquire too curiously how they are in the image. Mrs. Carlyle would not have been satisfied with that. Mm -hmm. And elsewhere he says, Tradition holds that every human is in the image of God, but it does not define precisely in what this image is to be located. So in what does the divine image consist? What is its essential character? That's what we shall try to explore this afternoon. We will be looking as we go along at certain other more specific questions. Does the divine image involve the body? Are women as much in the image as men. Is there a difference between image and likeness? But before turning to what the fathers have to say about this, let's just renew our memory of the primary biblical texts, or text rather, but Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, the word for man there in Hebrew is Adam, and in Greek it is anthropos. Greek, as you know, has two distinct words. Anthropos means a human being whereas anir in Greek means a male, and Latin has the same distinction, homo for human being and vir for a male. Unfortunately, English uses the same word man for both these things, and that can cause confusion. Then God said, let us make the human in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth 
So God created the human man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be, it's entirely disappeared, David, what I've written up there. Yes, it doesn't help. Uh, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Now, looking at this key text, we notice how the image evidently has something to do with dominion over all the other living things and over all the earth. The image also relates to male and female and it relates to God's command to the human race to be fruitful and multiply. We follow out these ideas later on. In the New Testament, you have 1 Corinthians eleven seven, where it is said the man, and this time the Greek is anir, meaning the male, not anthropos. The male is said to be the image and glory of God, and the woman is said to be the glory of the man. A difficult text um, and also twice in St Paul's writings 2 Corinthians 4 4 and Colossians 1 15 it is said that Christ is the image of God now we might therefore distinguish three levels if you like you have first the image of God and that is Jesus Christ then we have humans who are in the image of God that's level two and then of course we have painted icons made by humans because they are in the image, they have the power to make icons. So you have those three levels of image or icon. The word for image in Greek is, of course, icon. Those three levels distinguished. So a painted icon is an icon made by an icon of an icon. Um, we are in the image of God. We are icons of Christ, and Christ is the icon. So you can distinguish, if you like, three levels. Now, let's come back. No, it's restored itself miraculously. <laughs> and how have you done it so that it doesn't disappear? Well, wait for a little harder. Ah, you, you, you had some magic word, you said, yes. <laughs> So then, in what does the divine image consist? What is its essential character? Let's get down to this main theme. Now, first of all, a relationship is implied. Let us make the human in our image. To be a human person implies orientation or relationship with God. <coughs> the human person cannot be defined simply in terms of itself as an autonomous, self-contained entity. The human being does not contain his mystery exclusively within himself. So that means you cannot first describe a human person in terms of itself and then as a kind of appendix discuss its relationship with God. The human person without God is unintelligible. We have God as the innermost centre of our being, the determining element 
in our humanity. So God is central to our human person. That's the first and obvious implication of the fact that we are in the image of God. We are created for fellowship and communion with God. If we refuse that fellowship and communion, we deny our true self. We cease to be authentically human. If you affirm the human, you affirm God also. If you deny God, you deny the human also. So secularization involves dehumanization. And that we may see illustrated when we think of the Soviet Union, where you had a systematic denial of God, but also under Stalin, a systematic denial of the freedom and dignity of human beings. Um, and it's not a coincidence that these two things went together. So the human person without God is not human, but subhuman. So that's the first thing I see in the doctrine of the image and likeness, that the human animal is a God-thirsty animal, number one. I remember that illustrated many years ago by uh, a meeting in Oxford addressed by Father Sofroni Sakharov, the founder of the monastery at Tolleson Knights. And he gave a talk. I cannot now remember what about, but I do remember in the discussion the chairman saying, we have time just for one last question. My heart always sinks when the chairman says that because then uh, somebody will get up and ask an entirely impossible question. <laughs> and on this occasion, what happened was a voice from the back of the audience said, Father Sofroni, what is God? <laughs> and Father Sofroni replied, what is man? <laughs> so, yes, there he was emphasising the two go together. There is a mutual entailment between self-knowledge and God-knowledge. And so that would be my first point. You cannot understand the human apart from the divine. Then, self-aware. Heidegger says that man is an animal that thinks. So this is a second element that the divine image in the human person signifies. Self-awareness, consciousness, conscience, the ability to make moral choices, a sense of good and evil. Now we were considering before lunch that this may exist to some extent in animals as well, but not, I think, to the extent that it exists in humans. God is Logos, reason, God is Sophia, wisdom, and we humans in the image of God are those two things. So there, I think, is a second element that we might discern in the image. Then, thirdly, well, developing the self-awareness for a moment, um, we can say, yes, because we have this self-awareness, because we have this consciousness, we actually can use tools in order to shape the world, reshape it, if you like. That animals do, to some extent, alter the environment, 
sheep do so even by cropping grass. But animals don't use tools. Monkeys are very like humans. I don't know whether anybody has taught a monkey to use a barrow and write things down. I don't think that has happened yet. We humans can do that kind of thing by virtue of our self-awareness. Squirrels do not make liqueurs, as we mentioned this morning. At least I have not yet had that experience of drinking such a liqueur. Then we come to a third point, and there's a connection often between these points. We could say in the third place that the human animal is a Eucharistic animal, a priestly animal. We can offer the creation back to God consciously. We give creation a voice. We make it articulate in praise of God. And this again is not something that animals do. I often illustrate this point by asking, when does the new day begin? No, it does not begin at midnight. Not on the Hebraic Christian understanding of time. It does not begin at dawn. The new day begins in the evening. As it says in Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening comes before the morning. And what is the first thing that we do on the new day? we celebrate Vespers. Vespers is not an epilogue to the day, it is the first service of the new day. At Vespers we begin to commemorate the saint of what on the calendar appears as the next day. So how do we start this first service of the new day? A service that is not an epilogue but a prologue. We always begin Vespers in the same way throughout the year, except in Easter week. We we just got a voice from the back. I don't know. What yes, I'm is. afraid it's the wizard from upstairs. Oh, I see. Yes, right. Um, yes. So we always start the new day, except in Easter week, with. Psalm 103, in the Hebrew numbering 104. And that is a psalm in praise of the creation. Bless the Lord, my, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art become exceeding glorious, thou art clothed with majesty and honour. And then we go on to speak of the different creatures in the world, how marvellous are thy works, O Lord, in wisdom hast thou made them all, we say. So we always begin the new day. At the first service of the new day, we begin with a hymn of praise to the Creator. We offer the world back to God in thanksgiving. And in that act of offering, we become truly ourselves. So that's a third element in the human animal according to the image. A Eucharistic animal. Don't worry about this anymore. Please listen to me. So, yes, we are an animal capable of thanksgiving, capable of offering the world back to God, and that expresses our royal priesthood. Let me illustrate that by quoting Dostoevsky's work, Notes from Underground. 
Here the hero says, or rather the anti-hero, Gentlemen, let us assume that man is not stupid. But if he isn't stupid, he is monstrously ungrateful all the same. He is phenomenally ungrateful. I even think that the best definition of man is a creature that has two legs and no sense of gratitude. <laughs> and then, a little later, the same figure in the notes from underground says, Man alone can utter curses. It is his privilege and the thing that chiefly distinguishes him from the other animals. Now, all of this is very true of fallen man, of humans turned away from God and in rebellion against him. But in the case of humans, as God originally intended them to be, of humans redeemed in Christ, we are to reverse what Dostoevsky says, as he surely means us to do. The best definition of man, his chief characteristic, that which makes him to be himself is gratitude, thanksgiving. What distinguishes the human from the other animals is our privilege to bless God and to invoke his blessing on other persons and other things. So that I see as a third essential element in the human animal. Then we come on to a fourth element. The human animal is a freedom-loving animal. One of the essential elements of being human is that we can make choices. <laughs> As Cyril of Alexandria says, the divine is free after whose likeness man is formed. And St. Maximus the Confessor says, if the human is created in the image of the loving and supra-essential Godhead. Since the Godhead is liberty, this signifies that the human, as God's image, is liberty. In the Macarian homilies, the same thing is said. Heaven, sun, moon and earth have no free will. But you are in the image and likeness of God. Because just as God is his own master and does what he wishes, in like manner you also are your own master. And if you so choose, you can destroy yourself. So thinking of the divine image, let us call to mind the words of Kierkegaard. The most tremendous thing granted to man is choice or freedom. So, as God is free, so we, in God's image, are also free. God's freedom is absolute. Our freedom is restricted, particularly in a fallen world. But nonetheless, there is an essential connection. However much our freedom is restricted by what goes on around us, yet we still remain basically free. So if we want to put before ourselves some images of truly being truly human, we might think of Abraham, the explorer, been reading about him these weeks in the daily scripture readings. 
he sets off for the promised land, going off into the unknown with no idea what his final destination will be, an act of freedom. Or we may think of the feast that we have celebrated in the past week, the Annunciation of the Mother of God. The Blessed Virgin Mary freely accepts her vocation, the call she receives from God. The incarnation of Christ, as St. Nicholas Cavasilas says, is not simply a work of the Holy Trinity, but it's also the work of the free will of the Virgin, that God did not become incarnate until the angel had brought the message of God that she was to become a mother of God. He brought her that message and he waited for her to accept that. He waited for her to say, so be it, be it done as you have said. Mary could have refused the vocation of God. God persuades, he does not compel. And that was true above all in Mary's case. So she too is an example of freedom, the importance of human choices. There is, in a way, nothing more important than the world, in the world than the free choices made consciously by humans in God's image. So that again is an important, vitally important aspect of the image. And let us remember that freedom is always under threat in our own day, certainly. Here in Britain, freedom has constantly to be defended. And let us remember that freedom is tragic. It demands sacrifice, cross-bearing. As Nicholas Berdyaev says, and he was called by his critics, the captive of freedom, a title in which he delighted. I always knew that freedom gives birth to suffering, while the refusal to be free diminishes suffering. Freedom is not easy, as its enemies and slanderers allege. Freedom is hard, it is a heavy burden. Men often renounce freedom to ease their lot. That is exactly the point that Dostoevsky makes in the tale of the Grand Inquisitor. The Grand Inquisitor, out of compassion for humans, takes away their freedom. And he accuses Christ, you gave people freedom, but that was too hard for them. It caused them too much suffering. I have corrected your work, says the Grand Inquisitor. So freedom is a heavy burden. But as soon as we renounce our freedom, we reject the divine image. We become less than human. And if we deprive others of their freedom, we dehumanize them. Yes, um, under the heading of freedom, we might also take up the theme of human creativity. As God is creator, so to be a human person is to be a creator after the image of God the creator. As Athanasius says, we are sub-creators in the phrase of J.R.R. Tolkien. And because we are free, though we are all in the image of God, we each of us realize and express that image in our own distinctive 
indeed our own unique way. There is uh, a, a pair of Jewish sayings in Martin Buber that I often recall. The first is, God never does the same thing twice. And the second saying is, the world has need of every single human being. God never does the same thing twice. We are each of us different. We are each of us distinctive. We are each of us special. And the world has need of everyone. Nobody is redundant. Nobody is unnecessary. Everybody has the task of making something beautiful in this world in their own particular way. I often recall in this context what was said by the young son of one of our parishioners in Oxford. He was watching a program concerning endangered species and after seeing this he was strangely silent and his mother said to him, is there something wrong? He said, yes, I am important, aren't I? You see, I too am an endangered species. There is only one of me in all the world. <laughs> and there he was absolutely correct. Because we are free, we each act in a manner different from other people. We are each special. Yes. Then we come on to a fifth element that the human animal is a social animal, a political animal. And here we may reflect that being in the image of God means, yes, that we are in the image of Christ, the divine Logos, the divine wisdom. That is the primary interpretation of the image. But it also means that we are in the image of God, the Holy Trinity. Now, what is distinctive about the doctrine of the Trinity? What is it that makes our Christian faith, which is Trinitarian, different from the faith of Judaism or Islam? Judaism and Islam believes in one God, but we believe as Christians in a God who is one in three. Yes, so for us as Christians, God is not just a unity, he is a union. God is not just personal, he is interpersonal. God is not just one person loving himself, the divine monad, but God is a community or communion of three persons loving one another. For St. Basil, one of the distinctive elements of the Christian doctrine of God is that God is kinonia, <coughs> fellowship, communion, society. God is social, if you like. Within God there is an interrelationship from all eternity of the three persons, Father, Son and Spirit. There is an unceasing movement of love that passes between them. A movement of love that is called in Christian theology perichoresis. Could be translated as 
the round dance of the Trinity. So we humans created in the image of the triune God are created for relationship. We are given as our supreme calling to love one another. Let us love one another that so we may confess Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Trinity, one in essence and undivided. That's what we say in the liturgy. Our mutual love as humans reproduces the mutual love of the Trinity. Without mutual love, there can be no true confession of God as Trinity. And so, being in the image of the Trinitarian God means that we humans are created for society, for relationship, for mutual love. And without society, relationship, mutual love, we are not truly personal. Yes. And then a final point in the image, number six, is that we are pilgrims on a journey. Now, here many of the fathers make a distinction between the two words image and likeness. Probably in the original Hebrew, no distinction was intended. Hebrew likes to have parallelisms. But by the second century, the fathers were beginning to distinguish the two things, image and likeness. Some of our writers, says Clement of Alexandria, have understood that man straightway on his creation received what is according to the image. But what is according to the likeness, he will receive afterwards on his perfection. Origen says the same. Man received the honour of the image at his first creation, but the full perfection of God's likeness will only be conferred upon him at the consummation of all things. So if you make this distinction, the image is what we receive at the beginning, and it is never lost. Even the most evil and corrupt human being is still in God's image. The image may be obscured, but it is not lost. Image is our starting point, the initial equipment that we are given. Likeness signifies our end point, our final aim, holiness, deification, partaking in the divine life. So then, the image is where we start, the likeness is that at which we aim. Every intelligent nature, says Maximus, is in the image of God, but only the good and the wise attain his likeness. So the image is the basic constituent of human nature. The likeness denotes spiritual perfection. Image is starting point, likeness is end point. Image is potentiality, Likeness is realization. Image is possessed by all, likeness only by some. So the image is the initial gifts with which every human person is endowed, self-awareness, conscience, free will. But the likeness is the final aim, a fullness of life in God. Now, this distinction between image and likeness is not found in all the fathers, but it is found in a number of the most important writers, such as John of Damascus, 
Um, I don't think in the West Augustine does distinguish image and likeness. But if you distinguish image and likeness in this way, then you think of the human being in dynamic terms. We are pilgrims, explorers, on a journey. I think of the title of Gabriel Marcel's work, Homo Viator. Growth, progress, is an essential element in our humanity. As St. John says in the text I've already quoted partly, now we are the children of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. So, this is a further element then in the image of God, distinguishing image and likeness. This characteristic of humans is described by by Gregory of Nyssa, you'll have to look quickly before it disappears, <laughs> as epectasis. And that is from Philippians 3.13. cooperate with you but not with me it doesn't like my work hand, handiwork oh you're good at reproducing my handwriting <laughs> perhaps you've had some experience in forgery <laughs> yes <laughs> epictus is uh, that means reaching forward to what lies ahead. In Philippians 3.13, Paul says, Forgetting what is behind, I reach forward to what lies ahead. And Gregory of Nyssa um, says that even in the age to come, we shall continue to reach forward to what lies ahead. Being human is a journey that extends into eternity and has no final limit. Every boundary implies a beyond. Every ending involves a new beginning. So to be human in the image and likeness is never to rest satisfied, to feel an infinite thirst, a thirst for the infinite. So on this idea of distinguishing the image and likeness, homo viator, image and likeness imply a sense of direction, an uncompleted program. We are not yet fully human. And indeed always, even in the age to come, we shall have to advance further. So to be human is an appeal and a vocation. Once I was speaking about all this, as I thought, with a certain eloquence. And at the end of it, an elderly lady came up to me and said, I found your remarks deeply depressing. <laughs> and I said, oh, why? She said, I have had a hard and busy life. And I did hope that in the age to come, I was going to have a good rest. <laughs> well, perhaps we can answer that by saying that in the future world, there is a coincidence of opposites. <laughs> and that in the future world, we have both progress and journeying, and yet at the same time, rest and stability. Um, Maximus the Confessor sums this up in a fine phrase. Um, Ai kinitos akinesia, ever moving immobility. <laughs> so we often have to reach the truth, not by affirming a colourless compromise, but by combining two opposites.
both of which are affirmed without diminution. So that was my answer to this lady. Whether she felt encouraged, I don't know. So those would be, um, John, six elements in being a person that uh, I would want to underline. And of course we can develop these different points in various ways. Um, does the image of God involve the body? If you stress very much item two, self-awareness, conscious thought, then you will tend to say that the image involves only the soul, the reason. Um, and many of the fathers took that view. Um, and it goes back to Plato. He says the image and likeness of God involves flight from the material world, escape. Therefore we should strive to flee, he says, as soon as we can from this world to the other world, for flight means likeness to God, so far as this is possible. And flight from the world, as understood by Plato and Plotinus, means flight from the body. And this leads people in this Platonist tradition to say that the image has nothing to do with the body. Origin takes that view. So does Gregory of Nazianzus, so does Gregory of Nyssa. By God's image, says Isaac the Syrian, I do not mean the body but the soul. However, there is another tradition in the Fathers. Many of them would say, or some of them, that the image involves the total human person, soul and body together. They adopt a holistic rather than a separatist approach. And that's particularly this case in, uh, with Irenaeus. By the hands of the Father, he says, that is by the Son and the Spirit. The Son and the Spirit are the two hands of God. Um, Man was created in the likeness of God. Man was so created, not just a part of him. Now, soul and spirit are certainly a part of man, but not the man as such. For the perfect man consists of the commingling and union of the soul that receives the spirit of the Father together with the fleshly nature. So... This second view would argue that the image involves the total human compound, soul and body together. And you can find other people who say the same thing. Gregory of Nyssa says the image is not to be found in a part of human nature, but in that nature in its totality. So there is a tradition which would say the image involves the body as well as the soul. Um, then I asked another question that you may have thought a little unexpected. I said, um, are women in the image of God just as much as men? Well, there have been some fathers who said, no, they are not. And this was particularly the case with the school of Antioch. Right, writers like Diodor of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuestia, they took up the fact that in Genesis 1, the image is linked with dominion. And they argued that dominion is something that belongs specifically to the male. 
and not to the female. So, and they relied on 1 Corinthians 11, 7. The man, the male, is the icon and glory of God. The woman is the glory of the man. So it's only the man, the male, who is primarily in God's image. That was the Antiochian view. Um, and you find it in the West, in the case of Ambrosiaster, who was the fourth century Latin biblical commentator, he says it's absurd to say that a woman could be in God's image. What do you think of that? Um, a woman, he says, cannot teach or serve as a witness or act as surety or give judgment how much less can she exercise dominion? Well, today in our culture, women do all these things and we take it for granted that they should do so. So there I think uh, the fathers, or some of them, are reflecting the cultural attitude of the time. And fortunately, there are some other fathers who even in the early period took the view that woman is just as much in God's image as man and surely that is implied by Genesis 1 27 so God created the human in his own image male and female he created them their male and female are equal in, that's in Genesis 1. In the second creation story, Genesis 2, of course, Adam is created first and Eve is then taken out of his body as his rib. That might imply subordination of women. But in the Genesis 1 story of creation, to which I've just referred, there is no such hierarchy. Male and female are equally in the image. And I'm happy to say that um, uh, people like Gregory of Nazianzus in Oration 37 and Augustine argue very strongly that the phrase in the image applies equally to women, male and female. The woman has been made in the image of God in exactly the same way as the male, is what Basil says. So I'm glad that this view that women are not fully in the image of God is not the universal view of the early fathers. And when we are treating the fathers, we have, of course, to be selective. Now, another question I raised, um, which I've already answered, is, yes, uh, the, is there an image, is there a difference between image and likeness? And I suggested that there is indeed such a distinction, at any rate, in many of the fathers. So then, summing up, considering all these things that are implied in being in the image of God, let us renew our sense of awe and wonder before the mystery and the miracle of our own personhood. And let me end with a Jewish story. Samael, the lord of the demons, was summoned by Baal Shem, that was the leading Hasid master. And he saw on the foreheads of Baal Shem's disciples, the Hasidim, the sign of the image in which God creates man. 
And then Baal Shem, the leader of the Hasidim, sends Samael away. And before being sent away, the lord of the demons, Samael, says, Sons of the living God, permit me to stay here a little longer and to look at your foreheads. Now, if the lord of the demons so honours the sign of the image marked on our foreheads, the divine image in the human person, how much more should we honour that? St. Ignati Briancianinov, in his work The Arena, describing how monks should behave in the monastery, says the brethren should bow affably and courteously to one another when they meet, honouring the image of God in their neighbour. And exactly that is expressed when we sense the church, the priest bows to people as he senses them, and when he bows to them, he is bowing before the divine image present in each person. He is honouring that. So then, let us renew our sense of wonder before the beauty of our own personhood, created in the image of God, called to attain the divine likeness. So let us renew our sense of wonder before that endangered species which is you and me. Thank you.